Thank you for listening or watching our podcast. Baptism is a sign of the covenant and not our faith. We do not see baptism having its origins in the New Testament, but originating in the Old Testament. If this is true, then why does the New Testament so clearly seem to teach that one first professes their faith and then they are baptized? Where do we see baptism as a sign of the covenant rather than a sign of our faith? Where do we see that baptism is a picture of the gospel that shows us a warning and assurance of the Lord's blessing and his covenantal promises? If you are curious about these questions, please stay tuned and listen to our sermon on baptism. As I mentioned, we have a privilege of welcoming another member to our congregation through baptism. When we look at baptism, it's always unfortunate that there's many ways in which we desire to talk about baptism, right? And when we look at things like Titus 3, verse 5, we say, well, is this a sign that just teaches uh, regeneration? That when the sacrament is administered, the child is immediately regenerate. This is a sign that's merely just a memorial, that it's just sort of a, a symbolism that maybe... Uh, we're those who are set apart unto the Lord. Or is the Apostle Paul not even talking about baptism, but talking about the process of bathing in, in the Roman culture, not the, the pagan bathhouses, but the actual just practice of personal hygiene? And this is just exclusively a sign of regeneration, right? So we can go through all the different ways that we look at this sign of baptism. Yet when we look at this, Many times we, we don't understand what Paul's doing in the context of this letter and what it means for the people of Crete, that they're not a people who are known to have integrity, if you will. And so as Paul writes this, why, why is he writing it in this manner and saying these things about baptism? Is he saying that baptism is necessarily something that communicates regeneration, baptize, child's immediate regener- or immediately regenerated, and, and, and we just assume and we go forward with that? Is this just merely a mere memorial? What is Paul doing with this sign? How, how can we say that this is a sign of the covenant, and what does that mean? Well, as we look at this, we'll see and go through basically uh, two sections in this verse. Washing and regeneration, using Paul's language, so don't get uncomfortable yet. And renewal of the Holy Spirit. And so what does Paul mean in the washing of regeneration? And when we look at that, we can hear that, and we kind of take a step back. This is strong language, right? And people appeal to this text and say, this necessarily means that when baptism is administered, a child or whoever receives the sign of baptism is necessarily regenerated in the Holy Spirit. Now, personally, I, I would love that if it's true. I mean, wouldn't it be nice? We can get ministers together. We could go out door to door. We can baptize people, force the hand of God to regenerate people in our community, and we can live in a place that is not only sympathetic to Christianity, but loves Christianity. Well, I don't think any of us would say that that's true. I I don't think any of us, and, and I know especially myself, we're not strong enough to twist the hand of God to make him do something. So I don't think Paul is intending for us to to see baptism as something that's necessarily leading someone or forcing the hand of God to regenerate someone. Now, we look at this and we say, well then, what do we mean with this? Because clearly the Apostle Paul is saying the washing of regeneration. And so as I mentioned before, there are some who say that this is just dealing with personal hygiene. And Paul's drawing an analogy to that. Others say, well, maybe this is a reference to the ceremonial washings. But even that, it seems that even baptism has an allusion to those ceremonial washings and truly being cleansed by God. And so what does Paul mean by this? When we look at this, and I think when we dig a little deeper into the text, I think when he uses the language of washing, of regeneration, we look at John 3, I don't think I need to belabor the point that he is or seems to be making a reference to baptism and a reference of a true cleansing. And we may say, well, why would Paul do this? 
Well, think of Romans 6. In Romans 6, the Apostle Paul makes a very strong statement and exhorts us, exhorts us as those who have been baptized into Christ, been baptized into his death. And as Paul exhorts us from the sacrament, he's using that visible language of thinking about what baptism means. And we think about Paul, 1 Corinthians uh, 10, 11, uh, making reference to Cor Cor the Corinthian idolatry that's going on there. And he draws a correlation in 1 Corinthians 10 to Israel passing through the sea. So in Romans 6, what he's doing there is he's reminding God's people of the symbolism you can find in the Psalms of passing through the depths of the water into the realm of death, the mysterious Sheol you can find in the Old Testament, right? And so they, they would have this mindset and this picture of one being cast into the depths of the sea, never to be heard from again. You can find uh, those references in Job, for instance, and other Psalms. And when you have that reference of understanding when baptized into Christ in his death, Paul is calling attention to a particular point in the Christian walk. There is a time when we bore the sign of the covenant. We are set apart unto Christ. We are his people. And the baptism, like the gospel, has a twofold message to it, doesn't it? If you're not one who bows a knee to Christ... You don't want to meet Christ in the day of visitation. That is a dreadful, dreadful day. Because Christ is going to come and you're going to receive a baptism like the Egyptians, consumed by the sea, overcome by the sea, not delivered through the sea. But if you embrace Christ in faith, you have a baptism like Israel, a people vindicated, set on the other side of the sea, brought safely through the sea. So we have to understand this theology that Paul is bringing to us. He's speaking of this sign that publicly designates God's people of moving from an old identity to a new identity. And when we look at this, we may say, well, where does Paul speak of generalities like this? Is this really something we want to say? Well, we can appeal to the different letters that Paul writes and how he writes his letters to the saints of Christ. And I, I love the reference specifically to Corinth, where he says to Corinth, to the church of Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together. Second Corinthians, to the church of God that is at Corinth. Now, if you're familiar with the Corinthian church, this is not the ideal Christian life. There's division. There's gross, open immorality in the church. In fact, Paul says, expel the immoral brother. We have class elitism at the Lord's Supper. There's not unity in understanding what it means to be in Christ. 2 Corinthians, this other letter that he writes to the group, goes to such a degree that they are super and, and elite and they can stand above the apostolic gospel. And they can claim the, the wisdom of the super apostles in the place of the apostle Paul. And yet, they receive this rich greeting. It's not that Paul is saying this is wonderful, but it's Paul saying live consistently with who you are as the people set apart unto Christ. So let's turn back then to Titus. Titus 3. What are things going on in this particular church? Well, when we think about this church, we can see that while everyone in Corinth doesn't necessarily seem to be a Christian, there certainly seems to be struggles. In fact, Paul says, hand them over to Satan, let them be sifted so that the hopes that he returns before the day of visitation, right? And so there's a desire there. Paul doesn't know what's going on, but there seems that something needs to be done. And so we can't say that everyone who's necessarily in the church is necessarily regenerate. But we can say that everyone who is in the church is in the covenant of grace with God as they bear the sign of baptism, right? They're designated at a particular point where they bear the sign of the covenant that they are set apart unto God. Not saying they're necessarily regenerate, not saying they're necessarily unregenerate. But nevertheless, they bear this sign. There is a moment in time when they are not bearing the sign of, of the covenant of grace, 
And then there's a time when they bear the sign of the covenant of grace. Now we think about Paul using this language of the washing of regeneration. He speaks even in terms of the Trinity around this language. Where he speaks of God our Savior. We normally think of God being our Father. So he wants us to understand it's God who's our Savior, moved by his mercy uh, to redeem. The Holy Spirit. And then he identifies Jesus Christ as our Savior. So once again, identifying this uh, statement of who we are. Uh, an identity that we are those set apart unto the Trinitarian God. But we also think of who is Titus. Well, what is his mission? Well, what is his duty? Who is he? Well, Titus, we find reference that he's mentioned in Galatians 2, verse 3, a Gentile convert who is one who sets the precedent of uh, one who did not have to be circumcised as a convert. And so he sets his precedent in a bit of a controversy. What do we do with these New Testament believers? Are they circumcised or not? Well, Titus is one who sets the precedent that does not need to necessarily happen. He's identified as a true child of the common faith. So Paul mentored him, Titus 1 verse 4. He's a one who certainly is set here in Crete to set an order and to put elders in place so that he puts this church in order. And the Apostle Paul speaks of the identity of what a Huey Cretan is. And I guess in our day and age we say that Language along these lines would get one canceled. But what does Paul say? He says, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. 1 verse 12. It's not a positive reputation. I don't think I need to make that explicit. But Paul identifies a problem in Crete. And a problem of those who are of the circumcision party who have come into Crete. So he's saying basically Crete has their issues where they like to fight, they like to sort of stir up trouble and sort of probably get a little wild at the bar, if you will, put it in our day and age. People who celebrate their independence. Uh, maybe this hits a little close to home for Americans. But it's the reality of here you have this understanding of who Cretans are. And these Cretans are also those you can see are easily influenced by the circumcision party. Paul goes on to say they're insubordinate, means they don't like authority. Empty talkers basically speak with empty words, uh, speak about meaningless things, basically. Deceivers, uh, they are those who deceive the mind, deceive one's orientation. Uh, they are those who uh, are identified as a circumcision party, but not just the circumcision party, and they upset families. So we can understand that this place is ripe for agitation. Their, their tendency is to want to fight. Their tendency is to want to engage in controversy and drama and all sorts of things that are contrary to the Christian walk. This is why when we look at this in the context, right, we can see that they're called to be submissive to rulers. They're called to be ready for every good work. We have at the end of it the reminder of how they're not supposed to stir up controversy and issues. And so now we say, so then why Titus 3, verse 5? Well, when you put this verse in the middle, what is he saying to the people of Crete? You have been washed and designated unto Christ. Can't you hear what they would say as a congregation? Well, I'm from Crete. I'm a Cretan. This is how I live. This is who I am. This is my identity. And Paul's saying, but it's not. It's not who you are. You have borne a sign that designates you as set apart unto the living God. You are not a Cretan, you are a Christian. And you are called as one set apart unto Christ to bring glory to his name. You have been claimed, set apart by the Trinitarian God. Live consistently with that identity. You are no longer a Cretan, you are a Christian in Christ Jesus. And so now we can understand why Paul is using this strong language. Because you can understand where maybe they don't feel as elite as the Corinthians, where they're the ones that, you know, engage in tongue speaking and all these manifestations of the spirit that lead to their elitism. These are people that say, you know, I'm the, I'm the guy that used to go to the bar and stir up trouble and get into the fight, and that was my weekend fun. And now it's like, well... <laughs> 
I guess that's not what I'm supposed to be doing anymore, right? That's the transformation of what Paul's getting at. They can't say, I'm a Cretan. This is who I am. They're saying, Paul's saying, you're Christians. You bore the sign of being set apart into Christ. The power of the Spirit is at work in you. Give yourself over to it. So Paul talks about then, I would argue, this objective event, this objective time when they were not in the covenant of grace. Now they bear the sign of being in the covenant of grace, set apart unto God, identified as Christians, set apart in his church as the Lord works out his purpose. But there's also something else that Paul builds from this as a rich reminder. He says there's a renewal of the spirit. So this is assuring us, right? I mean, it's one of those things. We look at baptism, we get really nervous when we hear this washed, um, you know, this washing that transpires. The reality is it is a means of grace. We don't know when the Spirit works through the preaching of the gospel. We don't know when the Spirit works through the Lord's Supper. Uh, we don't know when the Spirit works through baptism. But again, I hope we're seeing that it's not just regeneration, right? So often we say, well, is it baptismal regeneration or not? Well, it's a sign that Paul's calling to our attention visibly, calling for us to see we have moved from death to life. We are those set apart in Christ. This is how we exhort our children. So it makes logical sense that you move from that to the understanding of the renewal of the Spirit. And this renewal of the Spirit is something that's rather significant. Same language we find in the transfiguration of Christ, the metamorphosis, we talked about this from Romans 12, verse 2, an important understanding of the Christian metamorphosis. It's one of those sayings where I'm sure that if you're a child and if you've gone to the lakes, there's different lakes you can go to and you can see a little tadpole and you see some of those little tadpoles with legs sticking out and then you go and you see even the different stage where it goes to a frog. That's not accidental. This is how God has created frogs. This is how he has made them, that they hatch from eggs, they're tadpoles, and they become frogs. But it's a wonderful thing where they start as one form that looks like a fish with a funny head. And then they end up transforming in, into a frog, right? So if a child has ever caught a tadpole and watched this process, it's a rather uh, significant thing. It's a rather interesting thing. And this is what Paul is telling us about the Christian life, not that we become frogs. But the reality is that we move from those who are fallen creatures, sinners, rebels, haters of God, haters of everything that's good, and transforms us to be a people that in the power of the Spirit, not only do we love good in the things of God, but it's actually the resurrection power of Christ that's working within us, transforming us unto that metamorphosis of moving from broken sinners to renewed Christians, being sanctified and transformed in the power of Christ in his resurrection. And so the Apostle Paul is saying to the, 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 the church here in Crete and to us today, don't see this as this event where you just enter into the covenant of grace, you receive blessings of Christ, he's in heaven, he's indifferent, and whenever it's time for him to return, somebody's going to tap him on the shoulder, he'll come back and he'll bring us to heaven. Right? We, we can fall into that mindset. And, and we fail to understand that we're united to the triumphant, resurrected Christ. What Paul wants us to understand is this Christ who has redeemed and made us alive and secured us and fulfilled the obligations of what God promised to Abraham, what he promises to Adam and Eve at the exit of Eden. That same Christ continually works within us transforming us from the broken, wicked sinners that we were to the glorified creatures we are going to be, setting apart for us not only the body of this age, but the glorified body, like the tadpole moving to the frog, only it's more glorious. You know, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, the, the broken vessel, the jars of clay, having the, the glory of heaven within us. That's the metamorphosis Christ wants us to understand, and, and what a place to say it to a people like Crete, 
of people who have this reputation of being rebel rousers. People are always trying to, to get into trouble and do all sorts of mischievous, immoral things. Paul's saying this same gospel is at work within them, within us, within you, and within me. Now notice, it's a temptation we can have, is we don't want to draw near to Christ. This is where the sign of baptism also reminds us. Christ has come to us. He's given us a sign. We are those who are set apart as his people, as his saints, joined to his church. Why does God do this? Well, Paul tells us he saved us, right? It's God who saves us. And he saves us, why? By his mercy. So Paul wants us to understand, because the temptation we can have, and you think of the circumcision party potentially sneaking into this church, bragging about their rights and their genealogies and their proper credentials and, and how they have really done the right methodology and they're worthy of God's affection because of these things. And if you do those things, you can have the same blessings as a circumcision party, right? You, you can hear this, you can hear things like this today. And Paul's saying it's not because you're worthy. None of us are worthy of God's redemption. It's because God is moved by his mercy. And this is something that is so overwhelming and beautiful that the Lord in his providence and his care and his mercy has taken a group of people and put them together in his church so that we actually begin to taste the blessings of heaven. Unfortunately, we don't always think of that in terms of our corporate worship when we gather together. But we are. We're joining together, enjoying the blessings of that heavenly worship. We are the Lord's people who have been set apart. And so we say, well then, why is Paul using the sacrament as an exhortation? Why, why would he speak of this sacramental event as being this, this exhortation? This is just unique to what Paul's doing. We're trying to read something into the text. Well, this is where we look at the Old Testament, don't we? And one of the passages I really love calling to attention when people say such things. A lot of people think you're going to jump right to Jeremiah 4, verse 4. It's a great text. We'll go there in a moment. Or Deuteronomy 10, verse 18. Well, we'll go there in a moment as well. Or 10, verse 16, excuse me. We'll go there as well. But think about Leviticus 19, verse 23. The people of Israel are not to eat of the fruit of the land. Now, most English translations say because it's unclean. That's not the original language. The original language is because it's uncircumcised. So when people say that circumcision is a sign of the flesh and there's no spiritual implication of it, well, then Leviticus 19 verse 23 makes no sense. Because Paul, or, uh, Moses is saying to the people of Israel, that as you go into the land, you don't eat of the tree because it's not circumcised, it's not consecrated unto God, which is what the sign of circumcision is. It's that sign of being set apart to the living God as his redeemed, looking to the coming Messiah in this context, that they're living their life in confidence that the Lord will be triumphant in his Redeemer and the seed of the woman. And then you think of Jeremiah 4, verse 4. If we're going to take this text literally then what we're going to have to literally do is be heart surgeons with such precision that we can cut the sack away from around the heart, <clears throat> excuse me, to every person that receives a sign. Because the, the Lord literally says, remove the skin from around your heart or the foreskin from around your heart. Well, I think all of us would say that's, that's not the intention of the text. Uh, Jeremiah is not saying that we have to literally cut away uh, the skin around the heart. So what does he mean? He means the intention, the orientation, the convictions, the very thing that moves you through this age. Now again, I'm not denying that the Lord works regeneration. The Lord does these things. But this is a consciousness of our call to the gospel. The consciousness of that. And Jeremiah is saying, listen, Cut away those things that stand in the way of your proper view of God. The things that are distracting you from seeing who God is. The things that you cling to where you say, these sins or these things will give me hope. Or these gods provide me confidence. Or these activities give me hope. Or these things are really my source of life. Now again, it's not wrong to have hobbies. It's not sinful to enjoy activities. 
But when those activities become the source of our joy and comfort, that's when it's a problem. Because we're living to pursue those activities and not living to pursue them as one set apart in Christ. And that's what Jeremiah is saying to the people of Israel. Now they're engaged in uh, outward and rampant and obvious idolatry. But here, this is a reminder of anything that stands in the way of the living God, cut it away. And so you have then these examples. We can go through other examples in the Old Testament as well. But you have these examples of where the sacraments are used as a means of exhortation to the whole community. So while it's true that Jack may not remember specifically the baptism, we can remind our children of their baptism, right? When they act out, you say, you are a child who is set apart unto the living God. You bear the sign of his covenant. You are called to honor him, to live for him, to embrace Christ, and to find your life in your Redeemer. It's also reminding us in in our times of doubt and struggles where we can say, well, how do I know that the Lord is real? How do I know that God is faithful? How do I know that God can deliver me through this sin-cursed world? We think about the implications of baptism and the the pictures that are there in Scripture. That's what Paul is doing for the Cretans. He's reminding them, no, you have been transformed. No, you have moved. But we think about the other images, the ark, Israel passing through the sea, the Lord's provision, the Lord's care for his community, and the call for us to live that out for his honor and glory as his redeemed. Because the flip side of the sacrament also reminds us we walk away from the covenant community. We walk away from Christ. We become like those outside the ark. We become like the Egyptians consumed in the sea. And so when Paul writes this to the Cretan church, he's saying, don't say to me, you're from Crete. This is how we are. This is just a reality. Paul's saying, no, you are not a Cretan. You are a Christian. And so when we ask that question, then how can this passage, that speaking of washing, truly deal with the reality of baptism and baptism being a sign of the covenant. Paul is pointing to this church, to the Cretan church, that they have a definite point, an objective marker, when they have entered into the covenant with God. They bear the covenant sign. And Paul is exhorting this church. Notice then how Paul sort of mixes things up. He has the exhortations before, the exhortations after. Normally in other passages he said, you are in Christ, therefore, and he gives exhortations. But here he's sort of hitting the the Cretan church a little bit. And he's saying, but you've been washed, set apart, called unto Christ, called to live for him as his redeemed. And as you were called to live as Christ's covenant people, understand that the power of Christ's resurrection life is promised to be in the midst of his covenant people. And so it's a call for us today, even in America, where you say, well, we're Americans, we're independent, we're whatever you want to say. The reality is we can't say, well, we're just Americans. We got to first and foremost say, we are Christians. And as we are Christians, we are set apart unto the living God. And we are called to take everything in our lives captive to Christ, to bring glory to his name as his redeemed. And so as we saw in witness baptism this morning, it is a sign that reminds us again, we are a people set apart into the living God, a people who have passed through the sea of death, a people who have passed through hell itself as we take hold of Christ by faith, And as we take hold of Christ by faith, we're reminded by this sign, we'll emerge unscathed because it is Christ Jesus who is our Savior. Let us then have the wisdom that as our children grow up in the faith, as the Lord is pleased to work in their lives at at his timing and at his will, let us continue to exhort our children to live out the gospel for, for the Lord's honor and glory. Let us also as parents 
have the wisdom in terms of how we raise up our children, that we do so in the Lord. And let us understand that as parents, we all struggle to do this. And so to be gracious with one another as we live out this gospel as a redeemed community seeking to honor our God. Amen. Thank you for watching or listening to our podcast. Belgrade URC is a Bible-believing, Reformed, confessional church that seeks to cultivate community around our Savior. If you desire to learn more about Christianity, please join us for worship each Sunday at 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. If you're not able to attend church, you can tune in to our Sunday live stream through our YouTube channel. Please subscribe to our current sermon series and weekly meditation through iTunes or your favorite podcast catcher. If we are not listed on your favorite podcasting host, please let us know through our webpage, urcbelgrade.com. You can also utilize our archive sermon series on our website, urcbelgrade.com. Most of all, we hope to see you sojourning and fellowshipping with us each Sunday. Until we meet again, may the Lord's blessing and peace be upon you.